name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, a new twist on Boris Johnson and the Lebedevs, a long running story which has featured extensively in the Byline Times and here on the podcast. In short, Alexander Lebedev is a former senior KGB spy and businessman. Evgeny, his son, owns the Evening Standard and is an investor in the Independent. Boris Johnson is friends with both men and, as Foreign Secretary, attended their X-rated parties in Italy without his security officers who were left at home in London. Documentary maker Mark Alden for Channel 4 and tortoise journalist Paul Croana Galizia now say they have independently verified long-standing claims that Evgeny was given a place in the House of Lords despite advice to Prime Minister Johnson from MI5. The Guardian is also reporting that the Lebedev's villa was being monitored by secret intelligence in Italy when Boris Johnson visited in April 2018. An intriguing tale. Before we get stuck into it, just a reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our wonderful monthly newspaper, which combines the best of our online offerings with content that you can't read anywhere else. Get details about subscriptions over at our newsbreaking website, bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. Welcome then to Peter Jukes, executive editor of the Byline Times, and Adam Bienkoff, political editor of the Byline Times. And Adam, you've been nudging away and nerdling away at this story for a couple of years at least, and it's something that Byline has, has had its teeth into for, for a long time. Yes, indeed. Um, we previously reported that the Prime Minister had overruled the advice that he'd received from the security services that was denied at the time by Downing Street. We now it appears we have further evidence of that from this documentary and from other reporting by Tortoise. We now understand that Boris Johnson was personally visited by two MI5 officers in 2020 who advised him against appointing Evni Lebedev to the House of Lords. Uh, we also understand from this reporting that the House of Lords Appointments Commission, which vet appointments to the second chamber. They also wrote to Johnson to advise him that the security services had highlighted, uh, quote, significant potential risks in appointing Lebedev due to his links to his father and the potential vulnerability of any information obtained by the nominee from his association with the UK government. So it's a, it's a builds on the picture we, we were already aware of. It's further evidence of how Johnson overruled security services, overruled the advice that he was given, and was determined to place Evgeny Lebedev in the House of Lords, despite the potential security risks to national UK's national security. Yeah, and while we give credit to other journalistic outlets for bringing the story up to date, I'm looking at an article now that you wrote back in May 2022 for Byline Times, in which you were seeking to get information about the appointment of Evgeny Lebedev but all the information that you got back, all the, the pertinent information anyway, was heavily redacted. So there was a vote by MPs last year using a sort of rarely used parliamentary device to force Downing Street, to force the Prime Minister to release the information that he had received from the security services about Evgeny Lebedev. And that vote passed and the Prime Minister was given about a month to respond uh, and he essentially ignored that vote of Parliament. What was released by Downing Street was he so heavily redacted to the point of being completely pointless in having released anything at all. There was no information on what the security services had told him, no information on, on Evening Lebedev whatsoever. Um, so there are lots of outstanding questions still remaining about exactly what Johnson was told about uh, the Lebedevs, why he chose to overrule that, and also... Why Johnson, uh, unlike some of our other Five Eyes allies, including uh, Canada and also recently Ukraine, have both sanctioned Alexander Lebedev for his connections, alleged connections to, to Putin. But Johnson resisted doing so. And Rishi Sunak has also resisted doing so even after Johnson stood down. And Peter, John Sweeney was writing about this on Byline Times as far back as October 2021 there's just something about the relationship between johnson and, and both lebedevs that 
seems to warrant endless scrutiny. All of the questions that are pertinent here about Evgeny's newspaper interests, about his promotion of Boris Johnson as London mayor, about Alexander's past in Russian intelligence, so many questions that have still never been answered. Well, you'd be fascinated to no, know, within a few months of Byline Times starting up in 2019, when the uh, proposed, at that point, appointment of the son, Yevgeny Lebedev, to the House of Lords in 1919, Otto English wrote a piece for us. That's four years ago, nearly, October 2019. But as soon as Johnson, before Johnson actually went for a second election, he was proposing... Lebedev Jr. for the House of Lords, saying there were security issues here. I think Adam is brilliantly placed to tell you about the symbiosis of the Evening Standard, to a certain extent the Independent, particularly the Evening Standard, owned by the Lebedevs, because let's remember, it's the father who has the money, he was a big banker, and a KGB colonel in London. But I'm really fascinated, particularly around this point in 2018, where Johnson had been to before, been to various parties, had served many, many celebrities, many, really name me a celebrity who hasn't been to a, a Lebedev party because he installed himself at sort of around 2008 onwards as the go-to party man in London. And I don't think many people knew then the history of his father. But we let's just flash back to that famous scene in Perugia Airport where Boris Johnson, then Foreign Secretary, was caught napping in Perugia Airport, clearly worse for wear, and he travelled to a party at the Lebedevs Platanova in Umbria for this big party without his security detail. Now, why is this important? Why is the Foreign Secretary travelling to a party in Italy without security detail at all important? And why would the Italian intelligence services be interested? Well, he had flown just from a NATO meeting where they were discussing NATO's reaction to the attempted poisoning of Sergei Skripal, a Russian dissident in Salisbury, which had killed Dawn Sturgis with Novichok, had killed a British citizen who picked up the poison. So this was a crisis. Hundreds of diplomats were expelled because we had a nerve agent used on British soil in its deepest sort of part of its military base, if you like, in Salisbury, so the centre of the military industrial complex in the UK, which had killed a British citizen. Johnson was at this sort of crisis meeting, and he flies to meet not just Yevgeny, who's the guy with the beard, the party-going one, who invites people like Ian McKellen, Mandelson, and Hugh Grant to these fun parties he has in Italy. His father was there. And we knew, and John Sweeney wrote about this two years, you adverted, that the Intelli Italian intelligence services had been deeply wired. We published part of their report, because they maintain that you don't really leave the KGB, a lot of people say this, and that Alexander, the father who was in London as a sort of semi-station chief for the Russian Foreign Service, their MI6, if you like, well, they're also internal, was still meeting regularly with other members of the Russian intelligence services every year, so that he was still a semi-active member. Now, what Tortoise, a brilliant work by Paul Kuhn-Galithia, discovered is that at that meeting in where the party on the 18th, in 18th of April, I think it was 2018, that he had been offered Johnson a back channel to Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. So there you have the foreign secretary with no officials around, no protective police, creating a potential back channel to a state which at that point, and we now know a lot more, was considered increasingly hostile. Now, at the same time, when questioned as foreign secretary in parliament, whether he'd seen any Russian interference in British elections, perhaps the EU referendum, he said he'd seen not a sausage, yet he was being offered a form of influence. We know that this happened in America with the ambassador of the M at the UN, and people got sacked for it. He was offered a channel to the Russian foreign minister during a crisis. Just to give a little bit more context, 
to Alexander, who this intelligence report, Italian intelligence is thought is mainly about the one we got two years ago. The new information that they were following Johnson, they knew about this party, is presumably because of their own security concerns. Alexander Lebedev was a senior KGB official and then needs to become a banker. And then he gets embroiled in the kind of 90s mayhem of post-communist Russia. And he basically, he is said to be behind the exposure of quite a sen- senior Russian investigator called Skuratov, who is investigating allegations of corruption around the Yeltsin family. A video came out of this Skuratov with two young women in inappropriate behavior, and he was forced to resign. And the person who benefited from that was Vladimir Putin. So you have a context in which Alexander, a former KGB, seems to be doing work with another former KGB agent, i.e. Vladimir Putin, who becomes president. Then we have a bit of falling out with Putin, and he has this quite well-remunerated position, owns a bank, right? He's a billionaire at this point. And he falls out with Putin, it is alleged, and his money diminishes. But he starts enough to come to the UK and start off this lavish lifestyle, has villas, two villas in, in Umbria, and buys a newspaper and invests in the independent. Now, what happens, and, and Adam's very good on this, could tell you more, that obviously a lot of Russian distance came or and business came over to London from, from the 90s onwards. And when Putin came to power, people who now lives here, Khodorovsky, there's Bereshovsky, another famous uh, Russian oligarch, who fell out with Putin. But a lot of those were either imprisoned or died mysteriously or committed suicide in strange circumstances. And what happens crucially around the Ukraine after the Maidan uprising of 2014, when Putin then invades eastern Donbass, you know it's him now, and annexes Crimea, that these oligarchs no longer have much autonomy. And you can certainly see it with the Lebedevs. I don't know, as I said, I'll hand over to Adam in a moment about Yevgeny's position on Crimea and Russia. But Alexander is clearly now on board with Putin because he owns a hotel complex. This is the father in Crimea. So all that apparent freedom these oligarchs had begins to change in this sort of, well, beginning of the war against Ukraine, because Ukraine was invaded in 2014. And Adam, Evgeny was a big supporter of Boris Johnson as London mayor, an enthusiast for Johnson's mayoralty. So there was this a thing we often return to on in Byline Times and on the podcast, this kind of close connection between newspaper publishers and politicians, not a particularly critical relationship. Yes, well, I, I, I was first covering Johnson's mayoralty uh, when, uh, right at the start, back in 2008. And around that time, a couple of years later, two, I think it was about 2010, is when the Lebedevs took over the Evening Standard uh, and invested in uh, the Independent. And at that point, Johnson was in need of some, some media allies as a very ambitious London mayor, wanting to, to, to make his way eventually back into national politics. And he struck up this relationship with Evening Lebedev. I've detained some, through Freedom of Information, some, all of the correspondence between the two men throughout his mayoralty. And you see this picture of a sort of budding relationship, lunches they shared together. There were annual trips by Johnson to the villa in Italy for these parties. There was back and forth about the City Hall supporting a Russian festival organised by Lebedev and Lebedev supporting a festival that was already run by City Hall, uh, a Russian festival. So there was this sort of symbiotic relationship, but they became quite close. They did photo opportunities together about homelessness, and they became very close friends. And even after Johnson left City Hall, they remained close friends. And indeed, in the run-up to the the Brexit referendum, Johnson reportedly, according to Michael Gove's former wife, Sarah Vine, made the decision to join and back the Leave campaign during a dinner with Evgeny Lebedev and with Michael Gove. Um, so there is this, this close relationship which continued once he became foreign secretary and, of course, when he became prime minister and put him into the, the House of Lords. So it's it's a very close and sort of tangled relationship between a senior politician 
and a senior media figure. And I think the the, the fact that Ignit Lebedev ha- does have this senior position in the British media has a big part in why this story has been so little covered by other newspapers. There's a saying in journalism that dog never eats dog. You'd think that a story like this with a politician, with lavish parties, with X-rated parties in, in Italy, with Russian oligarchs, security services, MI5, you think this would be made for the, the for Fleet Street to, to cover. But there is almost an immersion on, on, on discussing this, with the exception of you know, honourable exception of papers like the the Guardian, ourselves, uh, and Tortoise as well, covering this. But but most papers have really been very reluctant to to touch this story at all. But I think it's it's, it's hugely important. There's so many un- unanswered questions about it even now, and hopefully the, this documentary that's going to air on Tuesday will uh, shine some more light on it as well. And Peter, there's another layer here, which is that of the Russia report prepared by the Joint Intelligence Committee for Parliament, a report that Boris Johnson delayed the publication of and was eventually forced to accede to with great reluctance, parts of which are redacted, parts which relate, for example, to prominent donors to the Conservative Party, but which do suggest that Russia was seeking to exert an undue influence on British public life and that the British government had underestimated those attempts to exert influence on British public life. So, again, this suggestion that in the kindest interpretation of this, Boris Johnson and his fellow ministers were were asleep on the job when it came to Russian influence in this country. Yeah, sleep. I mean, I think trying to. I said the kind. I said the kindest interpretation, Peter. Yes, I, yes. <laughs> I think the kindest. Yes, exactly. Um, so that sort of moderate uh, interpretation was that they were forcing us to take sleeping tablets. So you're right about the Russia report. Uh, Dominic Grieb, we talked to, he was chair of the ISC, the Intelligence Services Committee at the time. They were very alarmed, and the most alarming thing they found. And the redacted bits, there's no direct reference to the Lebedevs as far as I can see in that. But what was resoundingly clear is there was no investigation. They, MI5, MI6 were never tasked to look at the possibility of Russian interference in UK internal affairs, even though a British citizen had been poisoned, Alexander Litvinenko had been poisoned in 2007 here with radioactive substances, even though the Scripple attack had happened. That is sounds to me like a kind of organized complacency, an organized laziness. And I was told, and I w- first went to an APPG in Parliament with Chris Bryant, various other people chairing it, and I was with Carol Cadwallader, Peter Pomerantsev, worked in Russia, a great writer on Russian affairs, and Edith Higgins of Bellingcat. And a prominent Conservative MP, very worried about Russia, his name's Bob Seeley, and he represents the Isle of Wight, said publicly, said, look, fine, go for Russia, don't make it about Brexit. This is problematic, because the one report which was released, looking at this in some detail, that is DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, was in the electronic, the online uh, intervention in the EU referendum. And they found masses of evidence of Sputnik and RT, the Russian, you know, at that point supposedly independent, we know now, <laughs> were just a branch of the Russian government intervening, filming for us. Every single bit of information was pro Brexit, pro leave. And that went viral on YouTube. And then we have the limited, because we never did the investigation, which they did in America, of the Internet Research Agency. This was called the Olgino, the St. Petersburg Troll Farm, owned and run and set up with a budget of $50 million a year by none other than Prigozhin, the famous Russian oligarch behind Wagner. Now, the Americans found extensive evidence of not only influence in the U.S. presidential elections 2016, the actually Russian undercover agents, if you like, going to the U.S., setting up fake accounts, setting up fake identities and PayPal accounts as Americans, and then thousands and thousands of Facebook posts, tweets, pushing for Trump or creating social division. 
Now, in the limited amount of research that was done in the UK, because Facebook were never subpoenaed to give their information, there were like there maybe 3,000 accounts pushing for leave. So you not only have a clear agenda of Vladimir Putin, he has spoken up when there was a delay, when Theresa May was in power, he said, oh, why are they delaying Brexit? This isn't democracy, they should get on with it. According to Ducardi, the Russian ambassador to London, who had all these meetings with the Leave EU campaign and the one up to Brexit, said when he returned to Russia, he was returned to Russia from the London, London embassy in 2019 when Johnson was installed, like he'd kind of done his job in some ways, I'd suggest, and said was given the Alexander Nevsky Medal for achievement. Nevsky famously fought off the West. He fought off the Speeds, a Russian commander and then Tsar who didn't like the West. And he was reputed to have said to a diplomat at this ceremony where he was given this medal by Putin and installed very prestigiously as the head of the diplomatic school, Britain is now down on its knees and will not rise for a very long time. Now, Brexit was, and it's been proven by just the evidence, but also analysis in America by the American army, part of their, their Operation Blitzkrieg, along with the American elections in 2016 around Ukraine, because they wanted to install they wanted to cause division in the transatlantic alliance and, and have candidates who'd be turned more of a blind eye to Putin's plans in Ukraine. And with Trump, you can see this again and again and again. Because it's been properly investigated by the FBI with the Mueller report, you see Trump changing the agenda around the national conference, the conference of Republicans before he became president. Oh, let's take Ukraine off the map. Let's not object to what Russia's doing there anymore. His campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was being paid by Yanukovych and Ukrainians and Russian oligarchs. You have the first impeachment people forget about of Trump in 2020, maybe 2019, about trying to persuade Zelensky to do a favor with him about Biden for more favorable treatment. So, the story of Vladimir Putin's plan to annex the whole of southern Ukraine, to actually take over the Ukraine, that abortive military mission of February 2022, you can see the planning for it from 2014 onwards. And one of the key parts of the planning was to affect conservative politicians and UKIP politicians. And the most worrying thing about the Lebedev revelations is that one of Boris Johnson's other close associates, a guy called Alexander Tomerko, Ukrainian-born when it was part of the Soviet Union, has said, you know, he's, he's anti-Putin, but seems to actually change his mind on this. But what he did say to Catherine Belton and the Reuters piece, the great journalist who's revealed a lot about Abramovich, he said Boris was persuaded to change his mind and back lead by a group of East European businessmen. So... Back to what Adam talks about, you have this confluence of money, media influence, and one of the most faithful decisions in Britain, modern British history, the decision to leave the EU, a decision which basically Boris Johnson fronted as the head of the official leave campaign, and one which he has ridden off, has ridden on the tails of, to become prime minister, to get Brexit done. And my appeal to skeptics about this story is not... Certainly not just a conspiracy theory. There's more to it than that. It's not about payback against the Russians. It's not about payback against Johnson. It's how do we protect the integrity of our media and our democracy from subversion and foreign influence? And if we don't have mechanisms to do that, if we don't have mechanisms to stop paybacks for oligarchs like this, then who's going to come along next? Will it be China? You know, you can't. It's, it, you've got to depoliticize it at some point and say, where are the safeguard? Where are the gu guide rails? And the DCMS had lots of recommendations on this, completely ignored, of course, by Boris Johnson, because you know they weren't in his favor. And one is a Foreign Agents Registration Act like they have in the US. I, if you're acting on behalf of a foreign power, fine. We don't mind people trying to influence us as long as you declare it. But what about Evgeny, Adam? I mean, he is the son, not the father. He was not a member of the KGB. And a spokesperson 
For Boris Johnson says, as the programme makes clear, there were no concerns about Lord Lebedev. He is a British citizen, is invested in British journalism, has extensively criticised the Russian regime. I've seen quotes from Lebedev spokespeople who say that this is some form of anti-Russian harassment. I think it's certainly the case that in recent years, and particularly since the invasion of Ukraine, there has been an attempt by Lebedevs to distance themselves uh, from Putin and from his regime. It's worth saying that wasn't always the case. And Lebedev Jr. has also, over prior to that, had written pieces in The Independent, had sent out tweets defending Putin's position and pushing, pushing for the UK to ally with Putin. And in terms of Alexander Lebedev, uh, correspondence obtained by the Times last year revealed that the you know the Russian embassy had sort of welcomed Evgeny's period as uh, somebody who had contributed to strengthening Russian-British relations. While we've also at Byline Times covered leaked inter- inter- Italian intelligence report suggesting that it was not quite clear whether Alexander had really ever resigned from the KGB. So I think it's. I think you do have to make a distinction between the the father and the son, but the the son only has the position that he does have in the UK, only has possession of uh, the Evening Standard and involvement in, with the Independent because of his father's money, and his father only has has that money because of his his position in Russia and his position in the KGB and and what followed in terms of his role as a, a Russian oligarch. So I don't think you can really disentangle the two. And if there is no, if even Lebedev doesn't have any current connections with Russia and Putin, then surely there's nothing to be hidden in terms of revealing exactly what security advice the UK government was given about Ivan Lebedev and about Alexander Lebedev. Surely we should see that. We also need to know what advice Canada and Ukraine have seen. They both say that Alexander Lebedev is a close associate of Vladimir Putin. We understand that the Canada's decision to sanction Alexander Lebedev was based actually in part on UK intelligence. So what is that intelligence? Why are the government so resistant to talking about that? Why have they not followed the, the steps that Canada and Ukraine have done or in terms of sanctioning Alexander Lebedev? Why did Johnson overrule the intelligence services in the UK by pulling even E. Lebedev into the House of Lords. These are all questions that just simply are not being answered by, uh, well, they're not answered by Boris Johnson, they're not answered by Downing Street now either. If everything is all fully above board in terms of Evgeny Lebedev and his current relationships, then there's no, he will have nothing to fear from that information coming out. But right now there is a complete emerge on all of those, those questions. And they're questions that very few people apart from Byline Times and a, a, and a few other publications are even asking at this point. Ones we will continue asking, I know. Many thanks to Adam Bienkov, political editor of the Byline Times. Thanks also to executive editor of the Byline Times, Peter Jukes. I'm Adrian Goldberg. Don't forget the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times. Please consider taking out a subscription. Get more details over at bylinetimes.com if you have already done so. Thank you very much indeed. This is a We Bring Audio production for the Byline Times. We'll see you again very soon. Thanks for listening now. Bye-bye.